Thank you for joining us on the program. Welcome, I'm Layo Olande. The Mali military junta has suspended all political activities in the country until further notice. According to a junta spokesperson, Cornel Abdullahi Maiga, what he calls sterile discussions during a national dialogue prompted the suspension. He adds in a statement via state television broadcast that the ban is to maintain public order. More than 80 political parties and civil groups recently called for presidential elections to hold as soon as possible to put an end to military rule. Mali has been ruled by the military since a 2022 coup. In the meantime, Sudan's military leader, Lieutenant General Abdel Fattah al burhan says the army will not hand over authority of the state to any internal or external party. General Burhan was speaking to worshippers after Idil Fitri prayers at a mosque in central Gedaraf state. He also stresses that the state will only be run by those who have stood firm against injustice and violations. The military leader warned that there would be no conversation on the return to democratic rule until the conflict that erupted in April 2023 has ended. The army has drawn support from Islamist parties that were influential during the long presidency of former President Omar al-Bashir, who was ousted in April 2019. Now, talks between the Sudanese army and the paramilitary rapid support forces mediated by the U.S. and Saudi Arabia expected to resume in Jeddah after the Eid celebrations. Authorities in Comoros say dozens of prisoners have escaped from a prison in the capital Moroni by simply walking through the main gate. The island public prosecutor Ali Mohammed said 38 inmates are missing from Moroni prison, which is the largest in the archipelago. He blames negligent security guards and the government spokesperson says the escape appears to have been pre-planned, adding that authorities have begun an investigation into what happened. Over in Kenya, a public hospital in Nairobi has laid off 100 doctors who are taking part in a nationwide strike that has been ongoing for almost a month. The Kenyatta University Referral Hospital said new doctors have been hired in place of those that are striking. Doctors in Kenya went on a nationwide strike in March, demanding better pay and working conditions. President William Ruto broke his silence uh, over the weekend over the strike, saying there is no money to pay the striking doctors. However, the doctors' union have remained adamant. Hundreds of them continue to take part in protests and presented a petition to Parliament uh, earlier this week urging lawmakers to intervene in their labour dispute. But for doctors who are serving, your skills cannot be taken away. Yes! Yes! Your skills cannot be taken away. Yes! You have your skills and you must protect it. Yes! You can only go to with these skills to the grave. Yes! And so we are saying that we are going to protect the profession with death, blood and tears. Yes! They should listen to us. We are not going to surrender. This is the beginning and we are going to be on the streets until our, our views are heard. What I really want to bring forth is that she's talking about, they're talking about the wage bill. They're talking about the wage bill. Kindly, Nakumich, I'm imploring you to cut across all the public servants in Kenya. It's not only doctors who are public servants. And it's unconstitutional according to our, to our labor laws. It's unconstitutional for a for minister to actually cut the, 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 the salaries of uh, interns of, or any employee by the government by 90 percent well back here in nigeria lagos state governor babajide somolu says more buildings will go down in lagos island as he decries the spate of infractions in the business district area the governor ordered the indefinite closure of dosumu market and mandated relevant agencies in the state to go after those flouting safety regulations the governor made these statements during his visit to the site of the fire incident which affected about 14 buildings on Tuesday. The market all around will be closed. Today, tomorrow, until when we're able to do a full assessment and to do a proper cleanup of this entire area. I want to say without any out of doubt that some other buildings are still going to go down. 
this is totally unacceptable. We will not allow a few people, a few people who will not comply with our rules, with our laws, to put the lives of others in danger. Fiscal planning, planning authorities, LAPCA, are going to be having a difficult time with me. And when they have a difficult time with me, you will know they will come on the street. This is fire that is happening too often, too many, and it is totally unacceptable. People put generators on top of roof, on third floors of buildings, on fourth floors of buildings, and we have said that this is not acceptable. Totally unacceptable in residential houses. And we'll see the consequences of inaction. Displaced persons in over 100 communities in parts of Plata State are to be resettled in their ancestral homes before the commencement of farming season. That's in fulfillment of the resettlement program by the task force saddle, saddled with this responsibility. Now, the group has given assurances of the speedy resettlement of internally displaced persons to their various communities with necessary intervention from government, especially in areas of security and reconstruction of damaged houses. The task force on resettlement of internally displaced persons has commenced on the spot assessment and interactive sessions with victims of attacks affected across 121 communities of Mango, Riyom, Bokos and Barkinladi local government areas of Plateau State. Terms of reference of the task force is to identify communities displaced within the affected local government areas to relocate the internally displaced persons and obtain their statistics as well as ascertain if the displaced communities were occupied forcefully with a view to making them secure the returnees with necessary requirements that will help them in resettling and ensure that security measures are put in place in these communities. Members of the task force embarked on the assessment tour in the affected communities. They had interactive sessions where some displaced persons have started returning, though with some anxiety, and they're asking the government to speedily commence the resettlement agenda. We are very impressed with the government as far as we have seen them on ground that they want to return those that are displaced. After this incident, most of their crops were destroyed. And as a result of that, they don't have any economic power. Task Force Chairman led the team to Mangu for the assessment and preparations for the resettlement, where over 67 communities were affected. If you have occupied a place illegally, we will take, make sure the law takes its course so that the people who are entitled to a fair hearing will get the justice. Another team, led by the vice chairman, retired Brigadier General John Sura, visited Bokos, where 53 communities were assessed. One of the things we are also assessing is not only looking at the households and their return, we also want to, we're also looking at the security situation around them. Transition Committee Chairman of Bokos Local Government Area, Monde Kasa, expresses confidence that the displaced persons will soon be resettled as government is set to ensure safety of lives and property in the locality. We have the vigilante, we have uh, professional hunters, we have forest guards. All these people are, will come together so that we will deploy them to these communities and uh, they will now give protection to the communities. As the process for resettlement of internally displaced persons across the affected communities continue, government should endeavor to put in place necessary measures that will facilitate the resettlement, especially in areas of security and intervention in rebuilding destroyed homes and provision of farm implement to boost agriculture, which is the main occupation in the areas. Rwanda is issuing a warning against promoting hatred and disunity to prevent a repeat of the genocide she suffered 30 years ago. Now, during the 30th commemoration of the 1994 genocide, Rwanda's High Commissioner to Nigeria, Mr. Christophe Bazivamo, conveyed this message in Abuja 
A commemoration-themed Remember, Unite, Renew over several years marks a solemn beginning to Rwanda's 30th anniversary remembrance of the genocide. This tragic event was a planned massacre by Hutu extremists targeting the Tutsi minority, lasting over 100 days. The path to lasting peace demands constant vigilance. And as we renew, we restate our unbreakable pledge to fight intolerance, discrimination, ethnic hatred, hate speech, genocide, revisionism, and denial in all the forms. But unfortunately, this is happening today just beyond Gwanda's borders in the Great Lakes region. We should never allow the embers of hatred to reignite. This Kwibuka 30, together we can ensure that the memory of the victims becomes a powerful force for good, inspiring future generations to choose peace over hate, unity over division, and hope over despair. Let us work together to build a world where such atrocities never happen again. Let us renew our commitment to the values of tolerance, compassion, human dignity in our our transformative journey continuously building a better future for all. The Johannesburg High Court has postponed the hearing of a bid by South Africa's former President Jacob Zuma to privately prosecute the current leader, Cyril Ramaphosa. The court has adjourned the case to August 6th. Mr. Zuma is seeking to prosecute President Ramaphosa for failing to act against prosecutor Billy Downer and journalist Karen Morgan for allegedly disclosing his medical details which were contained in court documents during his corruption trial. The former president argues that the alleged leak was in violation of the law. Last year, President Ramaphosa successfully asked the court to block the prosecution Mr. Zuma then challenged the decision at the Supreme Court of Appeal, but he was dismissed, with the court arguing that the prosecution of the president would be unlawful and unconstitutional. Mr. Zuma is now seeking to overturn that court's decision, which would allow him to pursue legal action against his successor. South Africa's unemployment rate remains among the highest in the world, according to Statistics South Africa. In the first quarter of 2024, 21,000 jobs were lost. Meanwhile, some entrepreneurs in Johannesburg believe the township economy has the potential to reduce the country's high unemployment rate. Our South Africa correspondent, Innocent Samosa, has more. Well, it's often said that entrepreneurship is vitally important for every economy, but they often face many challenges, be it crippling economy, weak currency, and lack of funding. 39-year-old Msizi Gombi has been running a mobile kitchen for the past five years. He firmly believes in the potential of the township economy to alleviate the country's high unemployment rate. Certainly it does. Um, it's only that uh, most uh, entrepreneurs in the township have uh, valued themselves and um, thought of themselves being small and medium enterprises. But nobody wants to be small. As small as I am today, I don't wish to continue to be small. So we can create employment, we can create opportunities for um, joint ventures, partnerships. With half of South Africa's population living in the estimated 532 townships around the country, businesswoman Lesero Sanelo says vast potential lies in the so-called township economy. Let's come together, but understanding that the solutions reside with us, within us, and we ourselves are the Indunas, are the Lokotlas, 
you know, because that's what it is. Um, and often we think because it's this eloquent English, it actually isn't what happens within our communities, whereas in fact, the systems mirror each other. The only difference is that the one is regulated and the other is self-regulated. Why don't we um, industrialize our very own communities? Who says it's not possible? You know, the capital resides within our own communities. So it's about shifting the paradigm in saying it's not as bad as we think because actually the solutions reside within us as a people. According to Lesejo, South Africa's efforts to develop townships face many challenges. The gap resides in implementation. We're very good at formulating policies that are among the world's renowned. We're not so good at executing. Entrepreneur Lerato Sanelo encourages fellow entrepreneurs to persist and persevere. So anyone in the township, the start for me is believe in your business, believe in yourself. And once that, that is the foundation, everything else can sort of start to fall into place. And the other thing that I realized, once that happens, you start to draw the right people. Um, and we need to stop looking at the solutions from the people that are way up there, you know. In a country with an unemployment rate of over 32 percent, some believe that the informal sector is a lifeline to countless families who lack formal employment. Meanwhile, Mzizi's aspiration to franchise his business continues. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Innocent Samosa, Channels Television News. We're still in the spirit of Eid in Senegal. President Basiru Diomaye Faye joined other Muslims for prayers to celebrate Idil Fitri. At the Kars Grand Mosque after prayers, the president uh, said the country's recent election had earned its people the respect and admiration of the whole world in his address to worshippers after prayers. The 44-year-old leader also thanked the Senegalese people for their role in ensuring that the elections went smoothly during the holy month of Ramadan. Now, Muslims across the, some northern states in Nigeria converged at the various Eid grounds to observe the two rakat prayers marking the end of the Ramadan fast. Governors Ubasani of Kaduna State, Diko Rada of Katsina State, May Malabuni of Yobe State and Umaru Fintiri of Adamawa State were among early worshippers who prayed for the country, particularly for security and the economy. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. After 30 days of fasting and supplications, Muslims are observing the Eid al Fitr prayers. Presided over by well respected Islamic clerics, the solemn atmosphere provides opportunity to offer prayers to the Almighty God for the peace and progress of the country. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. The two rakat prayers seal the Ramadan fast. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Governor Ubasani of Kaduna State is among the thousands of Muslims who observed the two rakat prayers at the Eid ground in Zaria. He urges the citizens to promote peaceful coexistence. I want us to use the lesson of uh, the month of Ramadan to continue to work for the progress of our state as well as the country generally. In Katsina State, Governor Dick Rada joins hundreds of worshippers at the Asan Usman Katsina Polytechnic Mosque in Katsina for the eight prayers. He solicits more prayers, support and understanding from the residents. We are grateful. It has really indeed been answered by Almighty Allah. We have seen a lot of improvement in the area of security. Hundreds of Muslim worshippers converged on the Yola Eid ground in Adama State to observe this year's Eid al-Fitr prayers. Governor Morofintiri, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar, top government officials and district heads are among the worshippers who prayed for the peace and unity of the state and the country as a whole. I congratulate all Muslims across the world, particularly Nigeria, uh, and in particular to urge us to live a life of moderation. The only way we can overcome this uh, is uh, to work hard and also to support government policies that are designed actually to alleviate you know, the sufferings of uh, you know, the poor people, particularly the common man. 
government officials led by Governor Bala Mohammed, alongside traditional rulers and the coordinating minister for health and social welfare gathered at the Eid praying ground in Boucher State to offer two units of prayers. Addressing residents after the prayer, Governor Bala Mohammed encourages them to pray for the leaders. We are calling on the people, especially our leaders, religious leaders, to pray for us as leaders across the board from local government, state, and even the federal government. Because if we don't have the country, we will not even have the differences of our party and so on and so forth. In Yobe State, Muslims have been urged to pray for the peace of the state and the country as a whole. We are happy, we are grateful to Almighty Allah, and we are prayerful that Allah SWT will accept our ibadah and will forgive our sins, and we are prayerful that we are among those that have been forgiven. Shortly after observing the Idil Fitr prayer in Maiduguri, the Borno state capital, Governor Baba Ganazulum calls on the citizens to pray for the peace and progress of the country. I urge the people of Borno state to intensify prayers for peace to reign in Borno state and for peace to reign in Nigeria. Muslim faithful in Kogi state, including Governor Usman Ododo and his predecessor, Mr. Yaya Bello, observed the Eid prayers in Okene with a charge to imbibe the lessons learned from Ramadan. Let us continue to practice kindness, generosity, love, and understanding in our daily life. Fasting is one of the five pillars of Islam, and the take-home message from across the Eid grounds is the need for worshippers to continue in the spirit of sacrifice and love. Well, the celebrations continue as hundreds of horse riders gallop to Zaria's Dabo Festival in Kaduna. Hundreds of revelers riding horses, playing musical instruments, and wearing colorful traditional clothing at this year's Derba festival in Zaria. Locals are celebrating the end of the holy month of Ramadan. If there is no horse riding, so people will be so, people will not be happy because every people, they are coming from every village and everywhere to gather to see their Amia in a color dress and other horse rider. For tourists like Barbara Patricia, it's always a fantastic time. It's always a very fantastic time for me to engage with the local people, to, you know, be part of their culture and um, just enjoy the festivity. The traditions, the, it's just so fantastic. It's, it's not to be missed. Jibril explains that the festival represents the number of horses and warriors that were present before the country's colonization, showing the allegiance and strength of the kingdom. Yes, it shows a strength. It shows that the kingdom have a warriors. The kingdom have a, a, a number of horses and a number of warriors. Before that, uh, before the colonization, you know how the, the kingdoms are, one will be fighting another kingdom so that you have a large kingdom. So it's still, uh, because after the colonization, there is no any going out to fight, but still we come out to show our allegiance and to show the strength of the uh, kingdom. The Derba Festival, an annual religious and equestrian celebration, comes on Eid al Fitri at the end of the month long dawn to sunset fasting of Ramadan. It falls on the first day of the tenth month of Shawal in the Islamic lunar calendar, commencing with the rising of the crescent moon. And finally, on the program, the United Kingdom has returned 32 royal artifacts looted from Ghana's Asante Kingdom in the 19th century. The royal objects were taken from the palace in Kumasi. The 150-year-old, mostly golden royal regalia will be on loan for an initial three years and renewable for another three years. And this is because legal restrictions in the UK have made it impossible to return the artifacts permanently. The loan deal is not with the Ghanaian government, but with the Ofum Tuo Osei Tutu II, and that's the current traditional ruler 
of the Ashanti people. And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Olaniji.